Hi everyone. I wanted to put together a mini lecture on story of your life in which I talked about some of the basic concepts that you need to know to understand what's going on in the story. I'm not really going to get too deep into the linguistics in the story. You definitely get more out of it if you have a linguistics background, but it's not absolutely crucial to understand what's going on. So I recommend you explore that through internet searches, and I'm also happy to point you to resources if you're interested. What I'm going to be focusing on is just the basic ideas of the story that you need to grasp in order to understand what's going on. I want to start out this lecture by showing you some pictures. Some of you may have seen these before. They're called figure ground images because they look different if you focus on the figure or the background. Look at the picture that should be on the screen in front of you now. Depending on how you're looking at it, you should see one of two things in it. You should either see a white vase in the middle of the image, or you should see two black faces looking at each other. I'll give you a moment to look at it and see whether you can see both of these things. The next image is a slightly more elaborate version of the same concept. Depending on whether you focus on the figure or the background, you'll either see a gorilla facing off with a lion, or you'll see a tree in the savanna with birds flying above it and fish leaping beneath it. Again, I'll give you a moment to look at it and see whether you can see both. The final image I want to show you is just kind of a fun one. Depending on how you look at this particular image, you can see Batman looking over a burning Gotham, or you can see the Joker laughing. Again, I'll give you a couple of seconds to see whether you can make out both of those in the figure. So, these figures come from a field of psychology called Gestalt psychology, which deals with human perception, how we see and organize information in our minds. As I hope you could tell from looking at those three images, we're simply incapable of seeing the figure and the background at the same time. We can flash pretty quickly back and forward between them. To me, sometimes they seem to flicker between the figure and the background. However, we cannot see both of them at the same time. So what I want you to take away from that is that the picture transforms depending on our perception of it at the time. So, how is this relevant to story of your life? Am I just showing you these pictures for fun? Well, imagine if our perception of this image depended on the language that we spoke. Imagine that speakers of language A could only see the white vase in it. And imagine that speakers of language B could only see the black faces. Now, as you read in the articles that I assigned you to take study notes on, we do have some evidence that people's language shapes their thought and behavior. You got to read about some of the experiments that linguists have done in order to trace the connection between thought and behavior. I should note though that it's kind of a controversial theory. Not all linguists buy into it. Some believe that there's no connection between language and thought. Some believe that there's a very weak connection. Nonetheless, to understand what Chiang is doing, we do need to buy into this theory. It serves as the basis of this story. Louisa's perception of time, her memory, her sense of past and future is profoundly changed by learning the heptapod's language, by working with it so intensely for such a long period of time. This is what she says about how learning heptapod changed her consciousness. 
Before I learned to think in heptapod B, my memories grew like a column of cigarette ash laid down by the infinitesimal sliver of combustion that was my consciousness, marking the sequential present. After I learned heptapod B, new memories fell into place like gigantic blocks, each one measuring years in duration. And though they didn't land in order or land contiguously, they soon composed a period of five decades. So we get something of a sense of how Louise perceives time through her narration. You may have noticed that there was something a little odd about the tense of her narration. Um, look at this one moment where she's remembering having brunch with her daughter. I remember a conversation we'll have when you're in your junior year of high school. It'll be Sunday morning and I'll be scrambling eggs while you set the table for brunch. You'll laugh as you'll tell me about the party you went to last night. Now, notice that the narration is in the future tense. We will, it will, I will, you will. But she speaks about remembering the event. I remember a conversation. So she's very clearly remembering the future. Time, in some sense, has become simultaneous for her. She's able to see the past, the present, and the future all at once. Given how weird the timeline in the story is, I think it's useful to have a sense of the events that the story covers and how they fit together. It's tricky because Louise is both remembering the past and remembering the future. And she weaves the two of them together in her narration in a way that reflects her now simultaneous consciousness. So in part of the story, she's looking back to the past. She's talking about how the heptapods arrive, about how she and Ian are recruited by the military. She tells of how she comes to learn heptapod A and B and develops a relationship with Ian. She looks at how the heptapods leave and suggests that she and Ian get married. Now, the actual moment when the story is narrated is the moment when Louise and Ian decide to have a child. And I'll show you the evidence for how we can tell that in a minute. So at the same time, she's not only looking back at the past and thinking about the present, but she's also remembering the future. She talks about how her daughter is born and grows up, she considers how she and Ian get a divorce and begin new relationships. And then tragically, she thinks about how her daughter is going to die in a mountain climbing accident. And she is basically going to be left alone with only Hectopod as her reminder of that time. I said I would talk about how we know that Louise is narrating the story at the moment when she and Ian decide to have their daughter. It's evident in the passage that ends the story. So let's take a look at that quickly. She says, from the beginning, I knew my destination and I chose my route accordingly. But am I working towards an extreme of joy or of pain? Will I achieve a minimum or a maximum? These questions are in my mind when your father asks me, do you want to make a baby? And I smile and answer yes. And I unwrap his arms from around me. And as we walk inside to make love, to make you. So notice the present tense here. These questions are in my mind when your father asks me. And I smile and answer. So that present tense is our big clue that this is what is happening at the moment of narration. So she's narrating it at the moment when she has to make the big decision about her daughter. The, the decision to have a child that she knows will die in a preventable accident. But she also knows that because of her changed consciousness, she won't act to prevent. So it's a key moment for reflecting on the issues of free will and predeterminism within the story. 
So some of you might be familiar with free will and predeterminism, some of you might not be. So I thought I'd give you a definition. Free will is basically the ability to freely choose our actions and determine our own future. By way of contrast, predeterminism is the belief that our future is decided in advance and we have absolutely no ability to shape it. People generally think that these two ideas are incompatible, that they can't exist in the same universe. And it's easy to see why. If we have free will, we have the ability to choose what we do, and so avoid the future that's laid out for us. If, however, predeterminism exists, our choices don't matter, and free will is meaningless. So, what's interesting about Story of Your Life is Qian presents a universe where they aren't, where they both can exist. And he does that by linking them to two different kinds of consciousness that are created by different languages. On the one hand, we have sequential consciousness, which is human consciousness, the consciousness that you and I have. And that's created by human languages, which some linguists controversially believe may come from a common root. There's a search for something called proto-world, which is meant to be the language that gave rise to all other languages. Um, these human languages allow for free will. We can make our own choices. We can shape our own future. On the other hand, we also have simultaneous consciousness, which is heptapod consciousness, the kind of consciousness Louise develops. And that's created by heptapod A and B. And because it results in knowledge of the future and a desire to live out that future, it results in predeterminism. Again, we see Louise reflecting on these two different kinds of consciousness in a passage that's pretty long, but I want to bring to your attention because it's so important. So, Louise says, The heptapods are neither free nor bound, as we understand those concepts. They don't act according to their will, nor are they helpless automatons. What distinguishes the heptapods' modes of awareness is not just that their actions coincide with history's events, it's also that their motives coincide with history's purposes. They act to create the future, to enact chronology. Freedom isn't an illusion. It's perfectly real in the context of sequential consciousness. Within the context of simultaneous consciousness, Freedom is not meaningful, but neither is coercion. It's simply a different context, no more or less valid than the other. It's like that famous optical illusion, the drawer of either an elegant young woman, face turned away from the viewer, or a wart-nosed crone, chin tucked down on her chest. There's no correct interpretation, both are equally valid. But you can't see both at the same time. Similarly, knowledge of the future is incompatible with free will. What made it possible for me to exercise freedom of choice also made it impossible for me to know the future. Conversely, now that I know the future, I would never act contrary to that future, including tell telling others what I know. Those who know the future don't talk about it. In that passage, Chan makes reference to a famous optical illusion by William Eli Hill called My Wife and My Mother-in-Law. Yeah, it's kind of sexist. So if you look at the picture on your screen, within it you should be able to see both a young woman or an old woman. You shouldn't be able to see both at the same time. So I'll give you a few moments to look at it and see whether you can make out both of them. Just as a hint, the young woman's chin is the old woman's nose, so hopefully that'll help you spot it. So Louise uses this as an analogy for the different kinds of consciousness 
enabled by language. You can either have simultaneous con consciousness or you can have sequential consciousness. You can't have both. So in short, you can either have free will or you can have knowledge of the future. So now that I've covered a number of the basic ideas that the story explores, the relationship between language and thought, the relationship between free will and predeterminism, the two kinds of consciousness, I want us as a class to look a little more deeply into the story and think carefully about its characterization, its structures, and its ideas. So we're going to be doing that in the form of a class discussion. So I look forward to seeing you on the discussion forums. I hope this lecture was useful to you.